In July 1945, the leaders of the victorious Allied powers gathered amid the ruins of Berlin for their last conference of the war. The crusade against Nazi Germany was over. That against Japan was drawing to a close. Part of the victory celebrations was a parade in Hitler's former capital by troops of the British 7th Armoured Division, the Desert Rats. They were watched by Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, under whom they had fought. It was the end of a long journey for the Desert Rats. Their war had begun in the deserts of Egypt and Libya in 1940. Two and a half years of hard fighting took them into the hills of Tunisia, where they fought another campaign. The desert rats then crossed the Mediterranean and fought in Italy. Finally, they landed in Normandy and advanced through Belgium, Holland and Germany. Now these gladiators stood amid the ruins of Berlin, capital of the enemy they had fought so gallantly. The birthplace of the 7th Armoured Division was Egypt. The opening of the Suez Canal in 1869 had radically shortened the route from Britain to her empire in India and the Far East. It made Egypt militarily vital to the British. When the war clouds began to loom over Europe in the 1930s, Egypt came under threat. Italian dictator Benito Mussolini had ambitions to expand his African empire. This consisted of Libya and territories in the Horn of Africa. In 1935, his forces invaded Abyssinia. The Italians quickly overran the country and annexed it. The British in Egypt were now under threat from sizable Italian forces based in neighboring Libya. At the same time, German rearmament and Hitler's expansionist policy in Europe caused the British reluctantly to rearm. One of the steps they took was to create a mobile division in Egypt. Major General Percy Hobart, a leading tank warfare expert, was sent out from Britain to form it. Within a year, he had created a unit which could operate with confidence in the desert. But by the summer of 1940, Hobo, as he was known, had fallen foul of the high command in Egypt and been forced to retire from the army. The troops whom Hobo had trained in Egypt never forgot what he had taught them. In February 1940, the Mobile Division was renamed 7th Armoured Division. It adopted the Jaboa, or Desert Rat, as its symbol, one which was still cherished by the division's descendant, 7th Armoured Brigade, during the Gulf War 50 years later. I, uh, I blinded them with my headlights, so he suddenly froze in my path and... The only way to get him, or to get him out of the way without squashing him, was to pick him up. And he's been with us ever since. This formation sign gave the division its nickname, the Desert Rats, by which it would be known ever afterwards. 7th Armoured Division had three main elements. There were two armoured brigades, 4th and 7th. Each consisted of three armoured regiments with a total of 150 tanks and a battery of 12 two-pounder anti-tank guns. The tanks used were the three-man Mark VI light, armed only with a machine gun, which had been designed for reconnaissance. And the larger four-man cruiser with a two-pounder gun, which fired an armour-piercing round. 
The third element was the support group, which consisted of two motorized infantry battalions and a regiment of 24 25-pounder guns. In addition, there was a reconnaissance regiment, the 11th Hussars, with its Rolls-Royce and Morris armored cars. The 11th would remain with the division throughout the war. Like all the pre-war British army, the original Desert Rats were professional, regular soldiers who had signed up for a minimum of six years. From the start, they regarded themselves as an elite unit, since theirs was the first purely armoured division in the British Army. When World War II broke out, the 7th Armoured Division was deployed forward to the wire, the fence that marked the frontier with Italy's colony of Libya. With only 30,000 men in Egypt, the British were heavily outnumbered by the 250,000 Italian troops in Libya. But for the first nine months, Mussolini kept Italy out of the war, so the Desert Rats could only watch and wait as Hitler launched his Blitzkrieg in the West in May 1940. However, on the 10th of June 1940, Italy finally declared war on Britain and France. For the Desert Rats, the fighting began in earnest the next day. Patrols of the 11th Hussars crossed the wire and carried out a number of ambushes. Over 70 Italian soldiers were captured. Throughout the next few weeks, the Desert Rats continued to attack Italian forts and other positions as they waited for the numerically superior Italian forces to invade Egypt. On the 13th of September, the Italian offensive finally began. The British needed to conserve their forces, so the Desert Rats fell back while maintaining contact with the advancing enemy. After three days, the Italians halted, 60 miles inside Egypt, and began to build a series of fortified camps. Two weeks later, Archibald Wavell, the British commander-in-chief in the Middle East, received a welcome reinforcement. A convoy of 150 tanks arrived from Britain. Wavell could now plan a counter-offensive to drive out the Italians. At the end of November, the Desert Rats undertook the first of two exercises. This was, although they didn't know it, a dress rehearsal for Wavell's offensive. The second exercise, which followed a few days later, was the deployment for the actual assault, although the troops were not told this until they crossed the start line on the 9th of December. British morale was high, even though they were vastly outnumbered, since the Italians seemed to have lost the initiative by stopping to dig in. Supported by Matilda tanks of the 7th Royal Tank Regiment, the 4th Indian Division, the other formation in what was called the Western Desert Force, had little trouble in overrunning the Italian camps and advancing along the coast. The Desert Rats simultaneously covered the open desert flank. By the 20th of December, no Italians, except prisoners of war and the dead, were left on Egyptian soil. There was now a pause while Wavell redeployed the Indians to East Africa to help eliminate the Italian colonies there. In their place came the 6th Australian Division, which renewed the offensive by capturing the Libyan ports of Badia and Tobruk. Pursued by the Australians, the Italians began to withdraw along the coast road to Benghazi, 
capital of the eastern Libyan province of Cyrenaica. General Dick O'Connor, commanding the Western Desert Force, now sent the desert rats across the base of the Cyrenaican bulge. 4th Armoured Brigade made an epic march through almost impassable terrain and arrived just in time to cut off the Italian withdrawal south from Benghazi. The three-day battle of Beda Fom, which followed, completed the destruction of the Italian 10th Army. Three thousand desert rats captured twenty thousand men, besides enormous numbers of vehicles, tanks, guns, and other equipment. It was the first British land victory of the war and was greeted with jubilation at home. The legend of the desert rats began amid the publicity about the decisive role they had played. As a tribute, the British Foreign Secretary, Anthony Eden, parodied Winston Churchill's famous statement during the Battle of Britain. Never has so much been surrendered by so many to so few. But the euphoria was short-lived, for a new factor in the desert campaign now emerged. Hitler sent General Erwin Rommel and his Africa Corps to Libya to help his Italian ally. The scene was now set for an epic contest between two elite forces. A contest which flowed back and forth across a thousand miles of desert battlefield for more than two years. While the Africa Corps was preparing to make itself felt, the desert rats had been sent back to Egypt to draw breath and refit. Their place was taken by the 2nd Armoured Division, which had just arrived from Britain. But part of 2nd Armoured was then sent to Greece, along with other troops. The British forces in Cyrenaica were seriously weakened. Rommel was quick to take advantage of this and attacked towards the end of March 1941. He rapidly drove the British back into Egypt. The port of Tobruk, largely held by the Australians, remained the sole British toehold in Libya. But this was now under close siege. During the summer of 1941, the Desert Rats returned to action and came up against the dreaded German 88mm anti-tank gun for the first time. This fearsome weapon was capable of destroying any British tank at a range of 2,000 yards, far beyond any British tank gun. The Desert Rats suffered heavy casualties in two attempts to drive Rommel back. In July 1941, Churchill replaced Wavell with General Sir Claude Auchinleck. The new commander-in-chief was determined not to attack Rommel again until he had built up the strength of what had now been renamed the Eighth Army. Eighth Army was now becoming a truly empire force, with Australians, New Zealanders, South Africans and Indians all serving in its ranks. There was also a brigade of Free French. And one of Poles, who were part of the garrison of Tobruk. But the Corps remained 7th Armoured Division, the original Desert Rats, whose nickname was often used to describe the whole of the multinational force which had formed around it. The war in the desert had now taken on a routine for the Desert Rats. At night, the tanks withdrew into what was called a close leaguer. Orders were given out for the following day. Supply columns arrived to replenish the tanks and other vehicles with fuel and ammunition. The 
crews cooked a meal and carried out maintenance. Only then could they get some sleep, but they still had to take turns in guarding the leaguer. An hour before dawn, everyone would be up and awake. By first light, the tanks would have dispersed to their daytime positions. When no fighting was taking place, which was for much of the time, the desert rats spent their days watching for any move by the enemy. Navigation in the desert was largely by sun compass, which worked on the sundial principle. Bearing and distance were worked out on a map, the bearing set on the sun compass, and the vehicle's milometer used to measure the distance traveled. During the day, the temperature was often so high that it was easy to fry an egg on the metal of a vehicle, as both sides quickly discovered. At other times, swirling sandstorms blotted out everything. The sand got everywhere. The desert rats lived entirely off their vehicles. Water was strictly rationed, and that used for washing often ended up in vehicle radiators. Food was invariably tinned. Fresh bread, fruit and vegetables were a luxury. The diet, monotonous. Tea was a desert rat staple drink. Not until nightfall would the tanks withdraw back into close league. The desert rat was lucky if he got more than four hours sleep a night. Nevertheless, the troops remained remarkably fit, healthy and cheerful. For many of them, the war in the Western Desert had a romance which was unknown on any other battlefield. As Field Marshal Lord Carver, who served with 7th Armoured in the desert for two years, makes clear. And on the whole, that was a very clean war. There were practically no inhabitants who were suffering. Um, the moments of extreme danger or discomfort were few and far between. And in between, it was really, uh, although a, a rough life, in many ways a very, very pleasant life with good people, good comrades, a feeling that you were doing something terribly important and, of course, involving one 24 hours out of the 24. It was a pure soldier's campaign played out on a massive sand table with few civilians or other distractions to get in the way. Orkinlex Offensive opened on the 18th of November, 1941. Its object was to relieve Tobruk and drive Rommel out of Cyrenaica. The 7th Armoured Division fought a grim tank battle for control of the airfield at Sidi Rizek, 25 miles southeast of Tobruk. It was one of the Desert Rat's most epic actions. On the 21st of November, they won no less than three Victoria Crosses. One went to Brigadier Jock Campbell, who displayed extraordinary courage, continually leading tanks forward in his open car. Tragically, Campbell was killed three months later in a car crash after he had taken command of the division. Lieutenant George Gunn of the Royal Horse Artillery commanded a troop of four anti-tank guns. His unit was attacked by 60 panzers. All his guns except one were knocked out, but he continued to man this until he was killed. Rifleman John Beely also sacrificed his life after single-handedly overrunning an anti-tank gun position which had been holding up his company. Eventually, 
the Tobruk garrison managed to link up with the attacking troops. The 8th Army once more drove the Axis forces out of Saranayake. But it had not delivered the killer blow, and the ebb and flow of the Desert War continued. Rommel attacked again in January 1942, driving the British back to a defensive line at Ghazala. Both sides now planned to renew the offensive, but Rommel got his blow in first at the end of May, using his armour to outflank the Ghazala line. The British tanks were widely dispersed and unable to concentrate before the panzers were amongst them. General Pete Messervy, commanding the Desert Rats, had his headquarters overrun and was captured, but quickly escaped and resumed command of the division. June 1942 was a month of desperate tank battles, followed by withdrawals as Rommel maintained the pressure. Tobruk fell, and the 8th Army was driven back to the El Alamein line, the last defendable position before the Suez Canal. Rommel attacked on the 1st of July, but was unable to break through. British attempts to push the Africa Corps back were equally unsuccessful, and by the end of the month, both sides were exhausted. In early August, Prime Minister Winston Churchill came out to see the brave but baffled 8th Army. He brought in a new command team, Harold Alexander as Commander-in-Chief and Bernard Montgomery to take charge of the 8th Army. Montgomery already had a reputation as a dynamic general who believed in showing himself to his troops. His first priority was to restore the self-confidence of the 8th Army and convince his men that Rommel and the Africa Corps were not invincible. By now, the Desert Rats were organized and equipped very differently from 1941. They still possessed two armored brigades, 4th and 22nd, but the amount of infantry had been increased to a lorried brigade, 131st Queens. The division had also recently been re-equipped with two new American tanks. One was the Grant, with its hull-mounted 75mm and 37mm turret guns. The other was the Sherman, with a 75mm gun. Both tanks were a match for the German Panzers, but their guns were still far outraged by the German 88s. At the end of August 1942, Rommel attacked again at El Alamein. Montgomery was ready for him. 22nd Armoured Brigade, commanded by Brigadier Pip Roberts, a veteran desert rat, stood in the path of the main German attack and repulsed it, destroying some 40 tanks. Once again, the desert rats had been at the right place at the right time and added fresh laurels to their reputation. Monty now prepared to go over to the attack at El Alamein. Although his army now outnumbered the Germans and Italians, he faced a well-entrenched enemy whose flank hung usually in the desert could not be turned because it rested on the virtually impassable Katara Depression. The need to get his armor through Rommel's extensive defenses meant a vital role for the desert rats. As night fell on the 23rd of October, 1942, the desert rats and other units of the 8th Army prepared for action. Montgomery's assault at El Alamein began with a barrage of 900 guns. <laughs> Then sappers went forward to clear lanes through the Axis minefields. The infantry set up bridgeheads the other side of the minefields. After five days of savage fighting, the tanks passed through. A 
but the Axis forces held on tenaciously, and the desert rats were unable to break out. The German anti-tank guns took a savage toll, as one British tank commander later described. There was a sudden shock, and the flames burst out under us. So I gave the order to bail out, and we threw ourselves down in the sand. I could see that only two tanks had got to the ridge, our officers and mine, and we'd both gone up in smoke. We joined up with their crew. There were nine of us all together. We were lying there in the sand, and we saw one of our tanks the right go back. We watched it going out of the way, and I remember one fellow saying, there goes our ruddy taxi. It was a scene which was to be repeated time after time, until at last Montgomery switched the weight of his attack from the south to the north. Gradually, Rommel's defenses were worn down. By the 4th of November, the Axis forces were in full retreat. Churchill exulted that this was the end of the beginning. As for the next two and a half months, the Eighth Army pursued its stubborn enemy, the desert rats often in the lead. They entered Benghazi, 450 miles from El Alamein, on the 19th of November. But every so often, Rommel would turn at bay and mount a stiff rearguard action to keep the British at arm's length before withdrawing once more. Nevertheless, on the 23rd of January, 1943, the Desert Rats entered the Libyan capital, Tripoli, having advanced more than a thousand miles in 11 weeks. The Union flag was hoisted over the port through which the Africa Corps, arch enemy of the Desert Rats, had originally arrived to begin their epic confrontation. The contest that had ebbed and flowed across the deserts of Libya and Western Egypt for two and a half years was finally over. Having reviewed his triumphant men, Montgomery paused. He needed to re-establish his now overstretched supply lines. But this time, there was no danger that the 8th Army would be sent reeling back by a sudden counterblow. For while he retreated, Rommel had been confronted with a problem which obliged him to continue falling back into Tunisia. On the 8th of November, 1942, American and British forces had landed at the other end of North Africa in Morocco and Algeria. They had then advanced into Tunisia, to engage Axis forces which had been deployed from Europe to prevent Rommel from being attacked from the rear. The Germans and Italians managed to halt the Allied advance 20 miles short of Tunis. A stalemate followed until February 1943, when the Axis launched an attack on the Allied forces in Western Tunisia. This temporarily knocked them off balance. The Americans in particular suffered heavy casualties. Montgomery now began to advance into Tunisia from the east. Rommel turned on the 8th Army. On the 6th of March, his panzers confronted it at Medinin. It was the six-pounder anti-tank guns of the Desert Rats' Queen's Brigade which played the main part in stopping the assault in its tracks. One gun, manned by Sergeant Krangles, accounted for no less than 14 panzers. While First Army advanced from the west, Eighth Army pushed up Tunisia's narrow coastal plain overcoming Axis defences at Marath and Wadi Akarit. At 
At the end of March, the Desert Rats met up with the US units of First Army. The relatively inexperienced Americans were fascinated to meet the men of this now legendary unit, and US cigarettes and rations provided a welcome change. When the Desert Rats linked up with the British elements of First Army, the contrast between the two was stark. The latter, with their green painted vehicles and conventional uniform, and their tendency to do things by the book, looked with surprise at the Desert Rats. Their battered sand-colored vehicles, deep tans, varied dress, and seemingly relaxed attitude to life made them seem like a band of gypsies. Eventually, 8th Army was held at Enfideville, at the top of the coastal plain. It was told to pass forces across to 1st Army for the final offensive. Among these was 7th Armoured Division, which helped to spearhead the advance on Tunis. The armoured cars of the 11th Hussars, which had been the first to enter Tripoli, were among the first troops to enter the Tunisian capital. When the Axis forces in North Africa finally surrendered on the 11th of May, 1943, a quarter of a million prisoners fell into Allied hands. For the Desert Rats, the main interest was the survivors of the Deutsches Afrika Corps, 15th and 21st Panzer Divisions, who had been their main and much respected opponents for well over two years. The lull in the fighting provided an opportunity for the Desert Rats to be reorganized in a more balanced way, to reflect the experience of the recent campaign. Two brigades remained, 22nd Armoured with three tank regiments totaling 150 tanks and a motor battalion, and the Queen's Brigade with three motor battalions and a machine gun battalion. There was also a chance for the Desert Rats to relax and recuperate. They were able to take leave, even to Cairo. But apart from those posted back to Britain to hand on their experience, the prospects of seeing their homeland again remained distant. In June, morale was boosted when the division was honored by a visit from King George VI, who came to pay his respects to this now famous unit. The completion of the North African campaign was a watershed in the story of the Desert Rats. For the first time they were to leave North Africa, where they had carved out their reputation, and cross the Mediterranean to set foot in Europe as part of the invasion of mainland Italy. The plan was for Montgomery's 8th Army to land in the toe of the country, while Mark Clark's US 5th Army assaulted at Salerno. For the first time, the Desert Rats would not be fighting with 8th Army, for they were assigned to support the American landings. The first US troops ashore met stiff German resistance. But units of the Queen's Brigade were able to land on D-Day to secure an assembly area for the division. And five days after the initial assault, the tanks of the Desert Rats came ashore. They then took part in the advance north to Naples. Conditions were very different from North Africa. The terrain was mountainous, and the Germans took full advantage of this. The roads, winding their way across precipitous slopes and bridges, were continually blown. there was no opportunity to carry out the swift outflanking moves that the division had got used to in the desert. Patience and ingenuity were needed to keep the advance going. Nevertheless, the desert rats entered Naples on the 1st of October. They then continued to advance northwards, but now they faced the autumn mud. There were also numerous rivers to be crossed. In November 1943, after three months of stiff fighting, most of the division was withdrawn into reserve. The 
The following month, Montgomery left 8th Army to take command of 21st Army Group for the invasion of Western Europe. He made a farewell speech to the men under his command. What can I say to you as I go away? When the heart is full, it is not easy to speak. But I would say this to you. You have made this army what it is. You have made its name a household word all over the world. Therefore, you must uphold its good name and its tradition. But several household names would be going with him, for Montgomery insisted on taking three of his crack divisions back to Britain, 51st Highland, 50th Northumbrian, and the Desert Rats. When they arrived back in England in January 1944, many of the veteran Desert Rats had been away for four years and more. But there was little time for relaxation. They had left their equipment behind in Italy and had to start again to prepare for the Normandy invasion. The opportunity was taken to redesign the divisional sign. This smarter rat, with his elegantly long tail, continues to be worn by today's Desert Rats, 7th Armoured Brigade. One thing, however, did not change. The Desert Rats continued to serve under Montgomery's overall command, and they welcomed his visits. At the end of May, 7th Armoured Division moved to sealed, tented camps near the English south coast. There, they were briefed on their role in the invasion. And from there, they drove their vehicles to the embarkation ports and loaded them aboard the vessels that would take them across the English Channel. The Desert Rats were not involved in the initial assault on D-Day. Their tanks came ashore on the Normandy beaches the following day and moved swiftly into action. They played a crucial part in fighting off the German armored assaults which attempted to destroy the Allied beachhead. Once more, the Desert Rats had to adapt their tactics to a new terrain. The Normandy countryside, known as the Bocage, with its claustrophobic lanes between high hedges and small fields, gave an enormous advantage to the German defenders. Lying in ambush and sometimes firing at almost point-blank range, the much-feared German 88 proved even more formidable than in the desert. And the Allies were also faced by the formidable Tiger tank. Not only was this armed with the deadly 88mm gun, but its frontal armor was impervious to any Allied tank gun. But Normandy did have its compensations. Every desert rat who fought there remembers Calvados, the fiery apple liqueur of the region, and camembert cheese. In July 1944, 7th Armoured Division took part in Operation Goodwood, Montgomery's massive armoured push to the east of Caen. This was designed to draw the bulk of the German tanks onto the British sector, so that the Americans could break out from Normandy. The assault was preceded by a massive attack by RAF Bomber Command. The initial stages went well. German defenders, dazed and confused by the carpet bombing, were made prisoner. But the enemy soon recovered and brought the advance to a halt. Despite this, Goodwood enabled the Americans to begin their breakout. And soon the German defenses began to crumble as General George Patton's US 3rd Army thrust deep through them.
Now came a pursuit, which reminded veteran desert rats of the advance through Libya after the victory at El Alamein. On the 28th of August, 7th Armoured Division crossed the River Seine after an advance of more than 120 miles. Nine days later, the desert rats had thrust forward another 200 miles to liberate the ancient Belgian city of Ghent. It seemed as though victory was at last in sight. As the Allies advanced through France and Belgium in the late summer of 1944, so their supply lines, which still ran from the Normandy port of Cherbourg, became ever more stretched. Finally, they snapped, and the race towards Germany's border ground to a halt. For the desert rats, who had managed to advance across the Dutch frontier, this meant a period of static warfare. Autumn turned to winter, and the 7th Armoured resumed its advance. But it was slow going against German defences which had largely recovered from the disasters of the summer. While some desert rats were able to get home on leave to celebrate Christmas, the majority were in the front line. Despite the setbacks, the end of the war was obviously in sight, and the epic odyssey of the desert rats was not forgotten. On Christmas Day itself, Corporal Bob Pass, who had fought with 7th Armoured Division all the way from El Alamein, was selected to broadcast a Christmas message on the BBC. And then the journey home did start, over North Africa, into Tunis, across the Mediterranean, into Italy. And a hard bit of the journey there, and still going on. Then back home again, but again just to start another journey, partly over the sea the night before D-Day. Journeying home with our backs to home, the beaches, Normandy, France, Belgium, Holland, and at last, Germany. Yes, a long road. Tragically, within a few weeks, Bob Pass would be dead, killed as he went forward to take the surrender of some Germans hidden in a wood. The final heroic stages of the war for the desert rats began in January 1945, when the division took part in bitter fighting to clear the Germans from the approaches to the River Rhine. They then went briefly into reserve to prepare for the crossing of Germany's last major natural obstacle in the West. This took place on the 24th of March. The division crossed the Rhine the following day and began its final advance northeast through Germany. there were still fierce battles to be fought against Germans who refused to accept that the war was lost. But nothing could hold up 7th Armoured Division for long. On the 16th of April, the Desert Rats liberated a prisoner of war camp, off Lag 11B, near Fallingbostrom. Among those freed were members of the division who had been captured earlier in the campaign, as well as numerous paratroopers who had fought at Arnhem and veterans of the fighting in France in 1940. The crowning moment for the Desert Rats was taking the surrender of Germany's principal port, Hamburg, on the 3rd of May. The division then moved northwards towards Kiel. And as they advanced, the Desert Rats found themselves responsible for ensuring the safe passage of the enemy delegation which negotiated the surrender of the German forces facing Montgomery's 21st Army Group. The surrender itself was signed on the 4th of May, and three days later, hostilities came to an end. But for the Desert Rats, their journey was not quite finished. 
After a month of occupation duties, 7th Armoured Division received the honor of providing the bulk of the garrison for the British zone in Berlin. The Desert Rats entered the city on the 4th of July, with General Lou Line, their commander, taking the salute. And on the 21st of July, the division was again on parade, enjoying its greatest day, a victory march past in front of Churchill, Alexander and Montgomery. Afterwards, Churchill addressed the division. Dear Desert Rats, may your glory never fade. May your laurels never fade. May the memory of this glorious pilgrimage of war which you have made from Alamein via the Baltic to Berlin never die. It is a march unsurpassed in the history of war. No finer tribute could have been paid to these gladiators, whose dash and spirit personified all that was best in the British Army of World War II.